Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from bitamount.com and bitamountlive.com in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and P.L. Combs Asian Art. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the Christie sale that took place last week. There were, there were a number of sales, as many of you know, during Asia Week, and we're trying to, going to sort of do an individual video for each auction house because there was there's so much to cover. I was looking at it over the weekend, figuring out how we're going to put these together, and, and I thought maybe we'll just do one for each of the major auction houses, something, something along that line. And I wanted to start with Christie's because they had a very interesting series of sales, and, and particularly their uh, Japanese and Korean art sale, which did so well. I mentioned it last week in the uh, end of the week video and talked a little bit about some of the prices to do with the uh, Japanese woodblock prints and so forth. But overall, the sale was very, very strong and it bodes very well, I th I'm hoping, for the Japanese art market in general because I think it's been ignored largely um, um, by many for the last couple decades. And I don't know why, because Japanese art is absolutely fabulous and just so underappreciated. It's a bit breathtaking. Um, and this sale showed that there is uh, some interest coming back. And even with some of the modern items, like the, these things by Matsuda Haru, Haru, who was born in 1980. Okay, he's a very contemporary artist. He does these fabulous little miniatures of insects and so forth and bronzes and whatnot. And they did quite well, 6,000, 7,000, 5,000, 4,000. And these are very, very nice examples. And, uh, and we saw some other things that were rather surprising. Uh, lacquerware did very, very well. Uh, Chinese lacquer uh, boxes, Suzuri bakos, and that sort of thing uh, went well through their estimates or met their estimates across the board all the way through. And most of them went through their estimates. So there, there is obviously some interest coming back in that arena. And I want to go through some of the pieces that were in the Christie sale just to give you a, 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 a sort of recap everything. All right. One of the things was this uh, wonderful uh, Akano Aino uh, screen that, w that went up. An absolutely lovely example. Flowers of the Four Seasons, beautifully colored, estimated at fifty to $70,000, and ended up bringing a quarter million, which is way over the uh, estimate. Now, this is a 17th century painting, um, uh, uh, be beautifully done. Let me see, what was I was going to get the sizes of it. 61 by 40, 145 inches. So these were fairly good size, but these weren't massive floor screens. They were a couple of two feet tall and so forth by uh, a few feet long. But absolutely great quality. And if you never haven't taken the time recently to, take, to remind yourself how great Japanese screens can be, uh, this is a, a wonderful example to start with. The brushwork, the way the flowers are shaded in here, the, the beautiful, beautiful, vibrant colors of this pheasant uh, standing up on this uh, rocky outcropping. And notice the rocks are very much done almost the same way they were done in China. Uh, uh, just sort of an interesting aside. And then you have the pine trees with the gilded clouds and mist flowing down over it. But just a stupendously beautiful work uh, uh, in, in two panels across the board. Absolutely beautiful work. And here are more uh, pheasants at the bottom and so forth. And the price was very strong, quarter of a million dollars. And then hopping over here to this, the Kato Gizan uh, sculpture of the woman. Many of you will remember that he had one. Uh, he's a living artist. He was born in 1968. And uh, uh, a number of months ago, Christie's had an example of a seated uh, male figure. Very similar in uh, treatment of the way the robes were done. But it was a man, he, if you recall, and he had big iron staples holding the shoulder together. That painting, uh, th that carving rather, did extremely well. And this one did as well also. It, 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 was went for thirty seven thousand above its high estimate of fifty thousand dollars so that and those little bronzes we looked at a minute ago show that there's some real interest growing uh, for for contemporary uh, Japanese art just as there is for contemporary Chinese art the contemporary art market in the Asian world is getting very very strong not dissimilar from the uh, contemporary art market in the West which has of course been strong for a very long time and then you had this this is a very nice Kitagawa um, uh, Udamaro uh, woodblock print of uh, one of the courtesans. This was part of a series that he did. Uh, there, there's a long history behind uh, in in this period in the 18th century, uh, 18th late 18th century, of the depiction of what was required to depict courtesans and women. It was a sort of a period of conservative uh, 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 beliefs, and that, that you had you had to get almost you had to get permission to paint. Um, 
courtesans, so to speak. So that was, it's a long story. But at any rate, this print was estimated $35,000 to $45,000, which I thought was a pretty strong estimate for one of these. It ended up going way over it to $75,000. Now, it was a beautiful print. It was in beautiful condition. The paper was absolutely uh, 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 fabulous. There's no staining on it. it. had a couple of minor, minor little splits above. But overall, for an 18th century uh, wood block, it was, it was in very good shape. The, uh, the, the, this particular strike was superbly well done. You'll notice here that the, 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 the woman's um, uh, 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 ear is uh, seen through the, uh, through the strokes of the hair and so forth. All these fine little details are, are sort of cherubic little hands. And then the, the tiny mouth, tiny eyes and so forth. But beautifully done, good colors. The colors were all nice and strong. The, the block technique was nice and neat. Everything was in, within its lines and so forth. Just a really lovely example uh, and a nice piece of paper and in good condition. And it went for $75,000. All right, and then hopping over here, of course, uh, the, uh, the first of the Hokusai uh, Great Waves or Under the Well of the Great Wave, as it is known. It, it, among the you know, the more formal of uh, those to collect them, uh, it was estimated at 120 to 180 thousand. Ended up selling for 437 thousand, uh, which is a significant amount above uh, the estimate, obviously, and it shows strength in the market. And then you had this other one, this other Hokusai, uh, that was absolutely beautiful example of the uh, fine wind and clear weather of Red Fuji. Uh, this was a, a, a wonderful example. It was estimated at 120 to 180 thousand dollars, sold for 250 thousand. And among collectors of prints, they consider this one um, to be on a par with or as good as the Great Wave. The Great Wave is maybe more visually, uh, more immediately recognizable by people because of its dramatic nature. Uh, but this, this among some a lot of a lot of big uh, uh, aficionados of Japanese woodblock prints think that this one is a bit more uh, uh, important. All right, and then you have the other great wave, and this one went way through the roof, uh, estimated at 150 to 200,000, and ended up uh, selling for $1.59 million, uh, which is, a, I, I suspect that's a record price. Uh, just a breathtaking example, but a beautifully struck print and in beautiful condition all the way through. You don't find any damage to the paper. Uh, the coloring is still nice and strong. The figures here, the delicate areas are, are very, very well defined and uh, just a lovely example and 1.5 million. So again, very strong in the Japanese market. And then uh, at the end, there was this very nice Korean bronze. This was a lovely little bronze, really was very early. Um, and if you scroll through it, you get a good view of the robes, the way they were done, the positioning of the hands, the patina, and everything uh, about it was lovely. It was about 10 inches tall, 9th or 10th century, estimated at thirty to $40,000, ended up selling for $162,500, uh, which is quite a strong price for a, a United Scylla to early Goyo uh, 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 bronze casting. But a lovely one, great surface, and... Uh, I don't know, was there a good provenance? Just Private Collection Japan uh, was the only provenance on it. So uh, that, that's an interesting outcome. And then this, the Hito Jakuchu, Jakuchu uh, painting from the 18th century, uh, an absolutely lovely example of cranes in the rising sun, beautifully done. Uh, this is a very crisp painting beautifully done for the period and almost looks contemporary. That was one of the things about his work. They had a very contemporary, almost Meiji period look to them. Uh, very unique at the time, very different at the time. Uh, some of the techniques, some of the, some of the uh, elements of the way they were depicted were sort of adopted from the way Chinese uh, paintings of the period were done. For example, uh, you'll notice here these little, uh, these little uh, they, in China they did them often as little pebbles and rocks and moss and, and green uh, circled in black and here you are they're, they're using them up on the pine trees and uh, but the facial expressions of the red herons the way the feathers are shaded in and that earthy sort of skin tone 
uh, of the feathers and then all of this very, very fine detail at the bottom all the way to the ground and the way the trees were painted. You'll, you'll notice that these are very, very similar to how trees were painted um, in, on, on Chinese porcelains of the same period or in Qinlung vases when you see pine trees going up. They, they have a very similar uh, surface texture in, in the handling of how they were depicted. Very interesting stuff. But this was an absolutely lovely painting, nice crisp seal on it, good, good calligraphy running down the side and uh, ended up selling for 1.59 million also, um, right in the same range as the, uh, as the Great Wave. Uh, this and it had a three to $400,000 estimate because Takuchu's paintings always bring a lot. And this was a very, very pristine example. But in the recent years, they haven't been bringing this kind of money, which was very exciting to see that. And then last was this Taikyo uh, contemporary bronze, uh, that I just thought was great with inlaid with 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 uh, inlaid with flowers, and we talked about this in the preview uh, when we were, I was looking over some of it uh, a few weeks ago in one of our videos when I brought up these sales, and I thought this was just a really lovely example, um, absolutely elegant. Uh, all the way through, and now this is contemporary, it's not antique or anything, and it was estimated at three to four thousand dollars, and somebody picked it up for four thousand US, and I think that was a very smart buy. I really do. I think some of this stuff is, is, is uh, just absolutely wonderful, and uh, I think there's a, there's a big future in a lot of this, especially the contemporary stuff. All right, and then hopping over to the uh, Christie's uh, Chinese Works of Art sale, get back to the top here, there we go, important Chinese works of art. The gross sale was $16,507,625, which is pretty good. Uh, that's a good strong number. And uh, these, these were not huge sales, only a couple hundred lots on the whole sale. And uh, we could take a look at it and see how they did. One of the things that we're going to see here is that furniture, uh, a number of months ago they had uh, some auctions with furniture in and the furniture was doing very, very well. Uh, they had, it was an online sale only, I believe it was in Hong Kong. And um, uh, the, the furniture prices were extremely strong. And furniture prices uh, are still are strong. This was a very, very fine, probably Kung Shi period, uh, Huan Wa Li low table, beautifully done, very lovely color to the wood. Uh, this, this warm honey color, uh, very nicely done. A lot of elements in here reminiscent of late Ming furniture, which is only natural, of course. And, uh, but a very fine selection of wood. The wood selection here is excellent. These returns look to be in good shape. They're not, they don't appear to be, have been damaged um, along the way. The surface of the tabletop itself was excellent. And they show some nice pictures of the table from an angle. Here it is. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the color of the, the wood was exceptional. Just really very, very lovely. Here's a picture of the top board, the floating panel, and so forth. And uh, the table was estimated at 25 to 35,000, sold for $97,000. And then over to this, this was one of the major highlights of, that, of this sale. And uh, this is an extremely unusual, 27 inch tall. This is a big, big wooden, carved wooden, lacquered uh, uh, Kuan Yin, uh, 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 I mean uh, Buddha rather. Uh, beautifully done, bearing the sword with, with red lacquers and gold lacquers, inset with precious stones, and this beautiful lotus bud, lotus seed pod coming up on the outside, Kung Shi period. And these were very important in the period because at, at this time, the Qing, the Qing had just come in, this was early in the Qing dynasty in the Kung Shi period, they adapted uh, 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 heavy, heavy uh, faith in Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, as a matter of fact, China became a protectorate of, of Tibet during this time. And uh, they, they showed their devotion to, to, the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Han, the Chinese Han, who they were trying to rule, uh, their devotion to Tibetan, to Tibetan Buddhism, just as the Ming Dynasty had been devoted to uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the, and the Mongols were as well. Um, the, the Qing, the Qing uh, uh, culture adopted the same uh, religious uh, followings and teachings, and uh, they developed this, this absolutely splendid looking uh, carved, uh, wooden carved uh, 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 Buddha. And you notice the, the, the treatment here that you've seen so many times in bronze with these lappets, and here it is just warm, elegant uh, uh, red and black lacquers going down. And the piece was in amazing condition. That's the thing that's really interesting about this. This has been meticulously cared for because it's not bronze, it's wood, which makes it very susceptible to damage and wear and whatnot. And it looks to be in absolutely great, great, great condition. Uh, it may have at one point 
point I didn't see the condition report. Maybe at some point it got a little bit of restoration here and there. But overall, it's a very handsome example, and uh, it is a big one. It's as I said, it's it's over two feet tall. Very lovely. Estimated at three to five hundred thousand dollars, which was a pretty strong estimate, I thought, and uh, ended up selling for one point three million. But Carved in wood. Uh, a lot of people will have looked at this and sort of skimmed by it and said, oh, it's, it's just another bronze. No, this was a wooden example and absolutely beautiful. And then over here, uh, monochromes at Christie's did awfully well. The enamel pieces did well, too. They had a, a Yong Chen dish that, uh, that brought a huge number and so forth. But monochromes showed particular strength across the board. And here you have one of these peach bloom uh, amphora vases that all of you have seen before. A very, very nice example with a hundred and twenty to three hundred thousand dollar estimate ended up selling for three hundred, uh, yeah, hundred. What was it? What was the estimate? One hundred and twenty to one hundred eighty thousand sold for three hundred thousand. So it went well over its high estimate. But the surface on this vase, if you if you took a look at this dur during the preview and magnified it bring it in nice and close. It has this very, very lovely surface on there. Not too shiny, not glossy. Um, again, uh, peach bloom, uh, crushed strawberries was how they used to be described the color of. And here you can really see it. That very, very lovely color. Lots of bubbles in the glaze and beautifully shaped. The shape on this was excellent. But these always were beautifully shaped um, uh, because they were they were highly prized by the uh, by the by the imperial court, and these were um, part of the. It's funny they, they they say the eight special the eight objects, but there are actually nine of them. For some reason, they picked eight because it was a lucky number. But uh, anyway, this was a beautiful amphora, and. Uh, did very very well and then if that wasn't enough this was even better and uh, this is an extremely rare there were only there were only um three there were only four of these known including this one the other three are all in museums so if you're a collector this is like your only chance to ever uh, probably to get one all right and this vase had very nice provenance it, it, i believe it had been through um, C.T. Lou in Paris by, by repute, and then Gallery Barrere in Paris, and then James, Jim Lally had this at one point. It doesn't get any better than that. And um, an absolutely beautiful thing. They call these string vases because of the little, we'll blow it up here and we'll take a look at it, um, the little lines around here. They call, they, but this would make them string vases. And most of these, as you know, in this form, the string vases were done in peach bloom or other colors. But uh, uh, they also did them with this, with underglaze iron red of these three-clawed dragons uh, running around the outside, which is very unusual. And these, these were made, they speculate, these were made very early in the Kung Shi period, uh, judging by the, the decoration and style and the way the mark was done. Uh, these are mark and period, of course. And uh, the way this type of mark executed in this fashion, stylistically, they tend to think was probably from the six, early 1680s, I think was the, the number I've seen in the past on these. But lovely white paste foot rim and so forth. And uh, this thing had Anwa decoration in it. And if you, uh, let's get over to a full picture and blow it up for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that'll do it. I'll bring this up. Down at the bottom. All in sites decorated, this wave pattern with the dragon coming out of the waves and this, this sort of archaic looking dragon on here because the Emperor Kung Shi was very interested. He was a big fan of archaistic uh, uh, Chinese art and, um, and at this time he was very young in his life. And uh, here you have these beautiful uh, 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 underglazed decorations into the, into the paste which were highlighted when they glazed it. Just a great example. And sold for $475,000, which was quite a price. Quite a price. And then hopping over here to this. This was something I just liked a lot. I love these, these types of celadons. I know, I know a lot of our, uh, the people that use our site do, too. We're always getting su submissions for, on, on, on Ming and Qing celadons that have nice crackle glazes on it. And this is a very nice one. It's either Southern Song to Yuan Dynasty, somewhere in there. Uh, but an absolutely great, great uh, example. Beautiful crackle, uh, mold, mold relief work around it of these scrolling vines. And then these bosses running around, the floral bosses running around the shoulder. But lovely color in the celadon. And then you have the exposed uh, unglazed paste around the top because the iron content turns that nice warm red color once it's in the kiln. And uh, it was estimated at twenty to 30000 and ended up selling for $43,000. Uh, it's a, sort of a great collector's thing. How big was this? Six and, three, six and a quarter inches wide. It's fairly small, but lovely, lovely piece. 
And then over here to this, another Ming Long Quan uh, barb rimmed uh, Celadon charger. This was a splendid example, and it was big. It was 18, I think, inches in diameter, and uh, but beautifully glazed. The glazing on this was really excellent, and you can get a good look at it when you pull it in here, and you'll notice like uh, along here on on the inner and outer how the uh, inner lappets. Uh, sort of shadow uh, the outer lap at edge like this. And this is what it should look like. But you notice how nicely the, 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 the tips of the lotus leaves pulled when the glaze, when it was applied and the glaze pulled back a little, they turn white. They, the glaze gets very thin, so the white paste underneath is revealed through in this very lovely color. This is like one of the best colors you can hope for in a solid on this sort of seafoam green. Uh, very, very popular among Chinese collectors and very popular among Japanese collectors. They loved this color. Uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of Japanese collectors bought these. And this was a big one. This was, like I said, 18 inches wide. Nice big presentation piece. And uh, the thing that they did on this that really pleased me was they showed a very good picture of the back. Uh, because that is what the back of the best uh, early uh, Lung Kwan uh, Barbara and Celadons look like this very, very tidy ring. Not so, on, on some Ming Celadons, you'll see the backs of them, and you'll have this unglazed area, and it's very sloppy and, and bat, you know, it's sort of all over the place because they were just trying to hold it up so it could fire properly. But this one has a very, very nice, neat firing ring on the bottom, and uh, it's a very nice, natural looking iron oxide edge uh, on it. Uh, the, the fakes and copies, it looks like they smeared paint all over it. And if you look at the uh, edges here on the foot rim, they would fire them on these stands that would fill in here, which is why there's no glaze left, so that the foot rim could be fully glazed. That way, with the foot rim, of the, the dish wouldn't scratch a surface, especially a nice Wanderlee table or something. And uh, you can look here and see how the uh, slight bits of natural wear on the glaze just from being used. If you see these plates, and there's absolutely no wear on that foot rim, you should be very, very leery of it, no matter how good the Celadon looks because uh, there should be some evidence of use and wear over the years because these kinds of plates were used often. All right, now, what did it bring? It brought $125,000, which I think was a good buy. It was well above its estimate, which, which was perfectly reasonable too. But it's, it was a splendid example. And again, monochromes did just fine. And then we get onto this, the Chan Chu Ping, uh, sort of Claire de Lune blue uh, 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 vase, Chen Lung period, Markin period. And uh, this was just a, a beautiful, subtle, elegant uh, object, and just in, as, 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 as is obvious, it's just a, a, it's a monochrome, but beautifully done. You notice it the, the, how nicely and, and, and gently the, the mouth is formed above the end of the body. It almost looks like it's been mechanically cut. The cut is so straight. When I first saw this, for, for, for a blink of a second, I thought maybe it's been cut down or something. Uh, because of how it, because that that upper section is so neatly done, it almost looks like it was just you know it was the the the, the, the photo it was either truncated or or the vase had been cut in height. It hadn't been cut in height. That was just how superbly well they potted it, and the color of the blue is excellent all the way through. It's that reminiscent of rouware and that that sort of blue, all right, and just went right down all the way down to this very very nicely done you know flowed right to the bottom glaze beautiful example and it was estimated at sixty to eighty thousand dollars because typically the familiar rose enamel examples bring the most uh, this one went for two hundred and sixty two thousand and uh, they did include very I'm very happy to see it uh, a nice shot of the bottom of it and that's what the bottom of it should look like that's what the foot rim should look like slight brownish areas and whatnot from age and, and, and uh, iron oxide and occasionally in the paste and then this uh, very nicely done uh, square seal mark uh, written on the bottom. But a, a lovely, lovely example. And a a notice how neatly the glaze comes up on the inside of the foot as well. So just, just beautiful, $262,000. And the other part of the sale that was sort of interesting at the end, there were about 28 lots of miniatures. And these were apparently acquired from the famous Yamanaka Company uh, prior to their, their, their being dissolved after the start of World War II. Uh, we've talked about that before, that, that unfortunately after the, the, the terrible attack on Pearl Harbor, um, there was a law that was put in place actually in 1917 that um, enemy combatant countries could not have stores in the United States, which is perfectly reasonable. We were at war with them. And so the Yamanaka country, Company, which had a had long time uh, presence in the United States in Boston, New York, Chicago, and so forth, um, were forced into liquidation by the federal government. 
and they published that famous, the yellow covered Yamanaka uh, uh, liquidation catalog with all these great things. And uh, when you when you take a look at these, you'll, you'll get an idea of the kinds of amazing things that were at the Yamanaka company. And these were miniatures. The biggest piece here, this one right here, is only one and three quarter inches tall. So it gives you some idea how small this wonderful little yellow jade tripod is in this uh, fantastic looking uh, 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 brush washer was. And uh, the lot was estimated at four to six thousand dollars, ended up selling for seventy five thousand. That was the biggest shock of these 28, uh, I believe it was the biggest price of any of the 28. Uh, but some of them went for just, you know, uh, you know, uh, five or 10,000, 12,000. Here's another one of two uh, uh, bronzes, Song to Ming Dynasty uh, bronze. This one's sort of almost shaped like a snuff bottle, but it's actually a, 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 a who form. And uh, estimated at uh, four to 6,000, ended up bringing 12 and a half thousand. And the biggest piece here, I, I think it's probably this one, was only two and three quarter inches tall, quite small. Uh, barely bigger than a snuff bottle. And again, these came from uh, the Yamanaka company in Osaka in 1945, right after the end of the war. And they were in the Lionel Rosenberg collection in Cape Town, South, a South Africa until 1968. And I don't know where it's been since. Maybe it's been, uh, you know, uh, held within the family by descent, as they say. But at any rate, this was a very interesting component of the sale because you've seen you don't see miniatures like this very often, especially 28 lots of them. And I do hope that one person bought all of them because uh, it's not a chance you're ever going to get again. Just a, a great looking, uh, great looking assemblage. And then over here to this, this is something you don't see very often. Um, for those of you that like carpets and textile, this is a Kangxi period Chinese carpet. These are fantastically rare because they got worn out. They were worn out and then thrown out. And, uh, uh, but it'll give you an idea of how incredibly fine carpet weaving was in China during the early 18th century, the late 17th century. This is a Kangxi period carpet with these beautiful scrolling vines all over. And then they did this highly effective gold, uh, sort of yellow yellow work against a, a, a tan or, or burnt tan color background. And then within this, uh, this fret outer border, and then this, again, the ground continues and goes to brown. Just a, a beautiful, beautiful example. And these were typically wool on cotton. And you can see the cotton fringe out at the end. And the, the tiny bits of wear on this was almost hard to believe. This was not a big rug. It was only small, you know, two or three feet by four feet, one of these things. But it's like a miniature painting, just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, in, in Kang Shi period. And uh, ended up selling for $43,000 against a twenty-five dollars to $35,000 estimate. But if you're a Chinese rug and textile buyer, you, you know how wonderful this was. And I think for what they are, when you consider other woven textiles from China, like imperial robes, uh, uh, this was a really wonderful buy. And this was probably uh, a carpet meant for the palace, uh, an imperial rug, because they, that's where most of them ended up, or very, very wealthy uh, influential government officials, but uh, not often. And then on to the incense table. This was a shocker of the day. Ended up selling for 2.5 million with an estimate of 800 to 1.2 million. And as I said at the beginning, furniture's been very strong lately. But what's very interesting about this is that this table is only uh, the only hexagonal top table of its type known. All right, which really uh, is, is an important uh, thing to point out uh, from this period. Absolutely beautiful carving all the way down. Um, and you see here on these legs, the way the legs are done with these returns, very much in the late Ming style. And you see it most often on vernacular furniture of China, uh, country furniture. And then these beautifully shaped, evenly done um, rue head uh, tips on the ends of the legs. And then these cross, these stretchers going between the legs that sort of hold the whole package together. Uh, beautiful Hanhua Li wood. Um, they call these shanji, which is it basically means incense stand, and it was uh, 35 inches tall, um, uh, not an enormous table, 19 inches wide at its widest point, but a great rarity in the furniture world, especially in the Chinese furniture world, in 2.5 million, well, well through its estimate, but a beautiful example. And then again, you have another table here. You have this Huanhua Li trestle uh, trestle leg table. Very, very nice, 18th century, again, very much in the Ming style. For years and years, they would always just say these were Ming, and now they're starting to increasingly say, that yeah, some of these tables were also made in the 18th century, uh, especially in the, uh, in the Kangxi period, and then there was sort of a revival, I guess, of them in the, in the Qinlong um, slightly later. But this, this, I suspect this was a Kangxi table, I'm not sure. 
but it looks it to me. Uh, but these, these beautiful archaic uh, relief work ends here with the dragons and then this lovely uh, patina to the wood. The surface of this wood looked awfully good to me. Uh, very nice color, it hadn't been disturbed or messed with by anybody. And uh, they provided some very good extra shots. There were six shots with this. I love how Christie's and Sotheby's, they're all getting very generous with photography because so much of this is now being done online. Um, I, I should have been doing this for years. It makes it a lot more interesting. But uh, they're doing it, and I'm glad for it. Uh, and very good pictures always. Uh, just a great example. Here it is. This is what I wanted to show you, these end panels. These absolutely beautifully done uh, carved out end panels here. Just exceptional all the way down beautifully done and nice strong grain nice nice variations in color and so forth and the table brought four hundred and fifty thousand dollars and then over here to this this is another another piece that came through the Yamanaka company uh, way back in the day um, here's the the label this is a label you want to look for this was from their Chicago store on Northern Michigan Boulevard 846 Northern Michigan Boulevard Head over there and start digging around their basement where that building was. You might find something. Uh, kidding. All right, and this was just a, a, porter of, a portrait of a statesman is, is how it was originally described uh, by Yamanaka because they didn't know what it was. And since then, they've determined that, that it's a portrait of the Yung Lo Emperor, which makes it a heck of a lot more interesting. And uh, it was estimated at eight to 15000 ended up selling for $125,000. But uh, classic uh, uh, Ming portraiture right here, beautifully done face, very expressive, uh, very neatly done, very orderly uh, whiskers coming off his face and around his jawline here. Uh, notice how there's no sideburns, it's just, it's just the, the hair comes out off the bottom of his jawline and the so, sort of almost cartoonish ears. The Chinese always had trouble doing ears. And um, also Japanese artists had trouble look, doing them. Sometimes they look like, like livers hanging on the side of your head. At any rate, um, you have this beautiful face, uh, these beautifully done eyes, very determined, um, um, and so forth. And the, and the painting did well. It brought $125,000. But it's a, it's a Ming Dynasty painting of the Yung Lo Emperor. It was probably done posthumously, but, but beautifully done. And uh, then over to uh, this sale. This was the uh, Jungkook sale. Uh, it, you know, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be an Asia week, I guess it seems like anymore, without something from the Jungkook collection. I cannot imagine how big the Jungkook collection was. Well, I can. It's it, it makes me dizzy to think about it. Th they've been auctioning off chunks pieces of the Jungkook collection now between Sotheby's and Christie's. It seems like it's been going on for over 25, 30 years. Just it's amazing. And you keep thinking the quality is going to deteriorate because they can't possibly have anything great left. And then, you know, last year they had the the statues and they've had bronzes and just all kinds of chariot fittings. Amazing, amazing stuff. And. Um, I don't know how Stephen Jungkook ever went to bed. And uh, here we have this absolutely great 17th or late Ming, early Qing dynasty, uh, 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 mythical beast crunched over in this beautiful piece of uh, nephrite uh, jade, uh, estimated at 100 to 150,000, ended up selling for 519,000. But a, and, and the wholesale did fine. All the Jungkook stuff did well. It always does well because of the provenance, and the provenance just keeps growing. But when you look at this jade and you come over here to the, forget the body, the body's well done, the, you know, the hairs on the tail are very well done and all that. But when you come over here and you look at the face of this wonderful little creature. Let's pull it in as far as we can. There it is. Look at the carving around this face, the expression. The, he's smiling, he's got his cheeks back, some little folds in his cheeks. And you can see it, this nice sense of, of how the carving was polished by these reflections here and here, especially here and so forth. Beautiful color of the stone. The eyes, the way they, the, the, the edges of the eyes sweep back. The brow, how it's so curved linear. And this beautifully done snout. And then this mouth where he's almost grinning. Just an absolutely wonderful jade. Absolutely a gem. And uh, ended up selling for 519,000. This was not big. This was what, how big was this? Three and a half inches long. Very small, but an absolute gem. Absolute gem. You know, much more interesting than a cut diamond, I think. And then over here to this, this yellowish green jade. 
Uh, from also from the junk Kunk collection, 18th century, estimated at 80 to 120 thousand, ended up selling for 200 thousand dollars. But this was a, a very very lovely example too. One, the facial expression, the symmetry of the face was outstandingly well done. The cut, the stone was polished down very very nicely, and it was a, it was a, a stone that transitions in color, obviously from green to brown, and the, the carver did a really great job of handling that transition. So where the natural skin tones would be sort of green, a little brown on the arm there, but, but beautifully done and uh, beautifully done face and then down to where the robes and legs and feet were and it transitions over to a brown uh, sort of amber tone uh, 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 jade and then this very nice uh, um, what appears to be maybe a later stand. It's hard to tell without looking through it. But at any rate, this sold for two hundred thousand dollars, and this was this was not enormous either. This was only five inches tall. This was small. It was about the size that probably looks on your monitor. But again, gem-like. But I like the little animal better. I have to I have to admit. And then over here, this was the Daniel Shapiro collection of bronzes. Which there, there was a small sale. Um, uh, five lot 502 out of the sale uh, uh, didn't sell. There were there were there were, there were five. I, I forget which one 502 was, but the rest of them did very very well against their estimates. 80 to 120,000 sold for 187,000. 200 to 300,000 sold for 237. Six to 800,000 sold for 1.1 million, and then the the uh, ritual bronze uh, the wine pour was the big gun. Four to six million dollar estimate and sold for 8.6 million. Uh, but these are the, the, the were the two big stars of the sale, and they had an interesting history. Um, 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 the Shapiro collection at shelf and where he bought from, and again we we, we come back. Uh, Jim Lally is starting to, his things are starting to turn up in auctions the way Yamanaka things do, uh, because he because he's he's such a, was such a good dealer. He just retired uh, from I think he's retired from dealing, but I think he's still very active and he may be doing some private dealing and lecturing and writing and. Uh, because he, he's the kind of person that could, I don't think. When I, I don't know him very well. I've, I've spoken to him I think once or twice, but I don't think he would give this up for anything. At any rate, this was a, a very very lovely wine vessel, a Fangi. Uh, this is uh, among the rarest of all of the Shang uh, ritual bronzes. From, they were found around Anyang uh, area. Uh, nicely nicely done. Beautiful natural patina on this. Uh, if you want to know what the patina should look like on a great bronze, that's what it should look like. Uh, one of several different ways they can appear, but the, the patina on this was particularly fine. And uh, Jim Lally did an exhibition on these, as some of you may recall. We talked about it before, back in 2014, and he did a catalog, and that catalog is over in the reference section, over on the bitamount.com uh, link to the uh, references and books. And uh, his, it's also linked off the new site, off the Bitamount Live site, so you can, you can reach the bookcase from either site. And, um, and, 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 and go over there and peek through. And he did a wonderful catalog of this collection of the Shapiro stuff. And, uh, and then you had the, so that, that went for uh, 1.1 million. And then of course the rare, 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 rare gong, uh, which is a combination of a mythical beast and, a, and an owl. Uh, if you flip this picture over here, the owl is on his back. There's the owl's head with his ears. Just an absolutely fabulous thing, really is. And uh, there are just a handful of these known as well. And uh, I, I, I looked through the other ones, and, and to me, the, of all the other ones, this looks like the best example, actually. You don't see that very often. Often the ones that you'll see, they'll come on the market that are similar to ones of the museum, but the museum example is better. And, and to my eyes, this looks as good as any that are in, in any museum, including the Palace Museum. The patina on this is just sumptuous. Just av looks like somebody powdered malachite and applied it to the body. Uh, which they didn't. This is all natural patination from the copper, but and the copper and the, and the metal alloys uh, in the bronze. But beautifully done. Just an absolutely great example. 8.6 million, and I think this was this is what a joy this thing would be to own. Wow! Imagine. Um, and uh, you, can, you, you know, most of you are never going to get to own one. I'm never going to own one of these. I can tell you that. Uh, but but you know, if you have a chance to go to a major museum in the United States. Um, and the, we have a museum list on the front page of the site. Some of them have um, some absolutely outstanding early, early Shang and so forth, uh, Zhao bronzes. Go, go look at them. Um, in person, examining a great bronze, really uh, read up on it a little before you go and go and look at one. And they're, they're, they're absolutely magical. They really are. And uh, this sale did very, very well. And, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, rarity, provenance, 
and you know quality condition all come into play here and uh, this is the kind of object that when collectors look at them they have to ask themselves when are they ever going to get a chance to buy one again and the answer is probably never unless the buyer of this one suddenly dies so you got to go for it all right that's it for this video. We'll get to one on the uh, on the Sotheby sale too, as quickly as we can. And we're going to talk about Bonhams, and we're going to we also want to talk about. See, I haven't even looked yet to see what happened over at Doyle's, but somebody told me they did pretty well. And uh, so, hopefully, Asia Week was a great success for everyone down there uh, because it's it's very good for the for the collecting community, and it's good for the dealer community, and uh, so on and so forth. We'll be back uh, later in the week, of course, with our regular video. And uh, thanks so much for watching and subscribe here. If you haven't already, come over to bidamount.com or bidamount live and visit and uh, join our little community. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a great week. All righty. Bye-bye.